with the easy angle, we have these numerical objective measurements of the scapula that we didn't have before because before we were measuring um, more of the visual component of the scapula. Is it winging? Is it not? Um, does it move too much? Is it more lateral? Um, it, there were just a lot of subjective terms that were used. And now we have these numerical values with the easy angle. Welcome to this Easy Angle podcast, where today we have the pleasure of speaking with Nicole Kasha, who is a doctoral student at the University of Kentucky, and she's part of the Rehabilitation Sciences program there. Her primary research focuses on understanding the biopsychosocial and biomechanical factors related to clinical outcomes in those with upper extremity conditions. Her time is spent collecting patient reported outcomes and clinical measurements such as shoulder range of motion and scapular kinematics. She believes that the ability to assess scapular biomechanical motion in the clinical setting is an important component to help identify abnormal shoulder function and thus to provide the most optimal treatment. She's also involved with the University of Kentucky's Sports Medicine Research Institute, where she collects and analyzes kinetic and kinematic data on the shoulder. Nicole has recently been part of upper extremity funded research work with a variety of patient demographics concentrating on the diagnosis and treatment of acute and chronic upper extremity impairments. And on top of all this, she's also a certified athletic trainer. So welcome today, Nicole. Thank you, Denise. Thanks for having me here. Yeah, so it's wonderful to have you on board. You're obviously you're very passionate about the shoulder and about the scapula in particular. So, the scapula, yeah. Yeah, so maybe um, I could start by asking, why is it important to measure scapular motion? Yeah, so the scapula we know plays a very crucial and important role in arm function. So there are actually bone pin studies that have demonstrated and shown that the scapula moves in three different planes. So when you move your arm up straight in front of you, we actually know that the scapula internally rotates, upwardly rotates, and posteriorly tilts. So there's this multiplanar motion that's going on, and it is also prone to being dysfunctional. So we've heard of terms such as scapular dyskinesis. Moreover, these bone pin studies and also 3D biomechanic studies have found differences between people who have shoulder impingement and healthy shoulders where these differences lie. So there may be more internal rotation in those with shoulder impingement um, versus normal healthy patients. Their scapula will be more stable. So being able to identify these differences shows that when there is a condition going on in the shoulder, the scapula is kind of taking some of the brut. So then when physical therapists kind of want to intervene on some shoulder pathologies, they know that they can intervene on the scapula and hopefully do some scapular strengthening exercises um, to then indirectly and maybe even directly help the shoulder condition. So, so this is why the scapula is actually very, very important and, and we need it for, for normal arm function. And so why then is it, why is it difficult to measure the scapula and its motion? So it goes back to its multiplanar motion. So the fact that the scapula doesn't move in isolation, it's, it's kind of resting around the thorax and it has the ability to kind of float and move around in this, in this triplanar motion. So with all of those motions being incorporated during arm function, um, it, it makes it difficult to actually measure, especially with our measurement devices that we currently have that really only measure in one plane, then we're limited to only being able to capture that single plane. And we know that it can be dysfunctional in either one of those three planes, but we're limited to that one single plane with our current measurement devices. But of course, so, now you have easy angle. <laughs> so yeah, the easy angle is just something that, yeah, that we're using and and because of the IMU inside of it, now we can actually measure it in any plane and any, not even just in the isolated plane, but you can put the easy angle in space somewhere random and then calibrate it to that, to that almost whatever spot in space and then say that's zero and then be able to measure um, any sort of motion in that, in that area, which is amazing. So what, how, has it, how has it helped then using the easy angle with these uh, shoulder measurements? So now we're actually using um, the easy angle 
to measure the scapula in three different planes. So we'll actually have a patient lift their arm straight up in front of them, and we will measure the scapula in the three different planes. So we'll have it in a horizontal plane. So this would be the transverse plane. So we'll place it on the scapula in this plane. And then we'll go to the sagittal plane, forward and back. So we'll see how it moves. Same arm motion. They're moving their arm up. We'll see how it moves in the sagittal plane. And then in the coronal plane, we'll see how it moves in upward and downward rotation. So now we're able to capture all three planes of motion in with one arm movement. So they'll just be lifting their arm up straight in front of them. And then we have these three different arm um, planes that allow us to say this is how the scapula is moving clinically without using bone pins or 3D biomechanic software systems that are expensive and cumbersome. And if you don't have a lab, so... Um, that's kind of where we're using it now in the clinic and even within our research. Fantastic. So w with your research, maybe you can talk a little bit about some of the research projects you've been working on. Yeah, right now we're trying to actually capture a clinical normative data set. So what that means is we're capturing anybody from the ages of 18 to 99 and we're having them come in and we're measuring their scapula in those three different planes that we previously talked about. And we're having them move their arm in a few different motions. So straight out in front of them, we're having them externally rotate out to their side, and then we're capturing how the scapula moves during these different arm motions. And these are normal, healthy um, people who have not had any previous surgery, no pain, no conditions. We're trying to see how the scapula moves normally in a clinical setting. So then now what we're going to do is compare those normative values to patients who have rotator cuff tears. So we're also capturing that in our clinical setting. And um, again, between the ages of 18 and 99, what we're really seeing is if you have a rotator cuff tear that's essentially chronic, usually between 40 to about 80 years old. Um, and with these rotator cuff tears, we're capturing anywhere from just fraying of the rotator cuff to a complete massive rotator cuff tear, which is um, known as cuff tear arthropathy. So we're trying to get this spectrum of how the scapula moves with these rotator cuff tears to see if there are differences. And a few other uh, biomechanists have actually identified scapular differences between patients with rotator cuff impingement um, between healthy, healthy subjects. So they've seen those differences in the biomechanical lab setting and we're just trying to identify it in this specific population in a clinical setting, which is, is very important because then it allows clinicians to be able to say, this is what you should look like or this is what you would look like. Expectations are starting to be set. And now we're going to have these, these clinical values that we never had before. So that's really exciting for us. That's fantastic. In the future, how are you planning to use Easy Angle? So we're hoping to do a multi-center um, study where we actually want to have an intervention be incorporated and then using the easy angle to see how the intervention has actually helped um, or changed scapular motion. So with that being said, we'll probably incorporate some randomized control trial study design into this um, and then potentially do a pre-op measurement and then a patient will undergo some sort of surgical procedure and then we'll do some post-op measurements and then with that, we'll actually have an intervention that we'll create that's scapular focused. So then the intervention will potentially be able to change the scapula in a way that we see and that we've identified in the literature as being healthy and normal and good for the patient. So with the easy angle, we have these numerical objective measurements of the scapula that we didn't have before because before we were measuring um, more of the visual component of the scapula. Is it winging? Is it not? Um, does it move too much? Is it more lateral? Um, it, there were just a lot of subjective terms that were used. And now we have these numerical values with the easy angle. That's great. That's great. Yeah, it makes a great comparison too. If, if you have one clinician who's measuring with the easy angle and then you have another one you can talk about the differences in the numbers not what you're just seeing visually with your eyes 
That's that's really that's, good. And have you have you, you got, I know you guys have already um, in, in the university there. You've already done some research in, in re the reliability of of Easy Angle. So comparing against the other tools, how how has it? Um, I mean, how does it compare to the existing software like the three D scanner or the bone pins? Yeah, so our validity study, we actually incorporated validity and reliability into our research project. Um, but just speaking on the validity, we actually found that it was very much comparable to 3D motion analysis. And that's what we used for our comparison. So um, with that, we found very minimal uh, differences in error. Um, we did find it was a little bit more difficult in the sagittal plane, um, but that was actually pretty unanimous across other bone pin studies that have compared their um, their techniques to motion analysis. So we're in line, the easy angle's in line with all of the other research, and that makes us pretty confident in saying this is a measurement tool that we can use right now um, and still be valid. So we've officially validated the easy angle, and then speaking on more of the reliability, which is important for in the clinic, um, intra rater, so that's within the the person who's using the, the device, um, we found pretty good, pretty good measures. And then interrater um, were, were pretty good. Um, and those numbers actually also align with what we've seen with goniometric measurements. Um, there's just a lot of variability in the way a human moves. So it's really hard to get perfect reliability and perfect um, inter and intrarater reliability when you're measuring range of motion. But with that being said, the, the fact that we're able to see these similarities, even if they're not excellent or perfect reliability measures, they're in line with what we already know and see and have identified with other measures. So it's it's pretty nice. And it again, it gives us confidence to, to use it in our research and, and to continue to incorporate it into our clinical practice. Fantastic. And for, yes. for people that are already in the field and have easy angle, can they measure scapular motion? Is that, uh, is that something they can also do? Oh, they better. <laughs> <laughs> They're dealing with the shoulder. Um, yeah, so we actually, in, we actually wrote a manuscript for that validity project. And um, it's currently in review. We don't know um, when that uh, publication would come out but within that manuscript we actually wrote some standard operating procedures and we found that if a clinician utilizes those standard operating procedures their reliability increases so so we really encourage other clinicians to use those standard operating procedures and we would love to create a video to be able to actually show clinicians how to use them and then also um, I can do some training too, and we talked about that within um, my research team about going out to these multi-center areas uh, to be able to teach other clinicians how to use the easy angle so that we have good, consistent reliability across our research projects. Um, so yes, definitely, and we hope that that's something that will be used with the easy angle in the future. Fantastic. Well, we, of course, would be delighted to help you make a video so that we can show people actually how to take yes. the measurements. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. It's, I mean, it's, I think it's really, it's really informative and very, very exciting, the work that you're doing and the research. I think um, as a person who has some shoulder pathology, I'm very excited to see where your research goes and to see how Easy Angle can be used to, to help kind of improve the outcomes of patients. Yes, new avenues are definitely being opened up currently, and it's nice to kind of be within that while it's occurring. So I'm excited too. Fantastic. Okay, well, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. Thanks for having me. I enjoyed it. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Thank you.